So um, bear with me as I just work through a couple um, announcements here. Uh, I just let you know we're going to be recording. If anyone has a problem, feel free to drop off. We'll just be putting this on our YouTube and keeping it for posterity. Um, I'd also like to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional territories we're all gathered here on in the Salish Sea. I'm joining you from Galliano Island in the territories of Penelicate, so and other Hoklamenum speaking people. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share this experience with you here at this special place in the Salish Sea. Um, I realize we're all tuning in from different parts of the Salish Sea region, so now would be a great moment to um, say hello here on the video chat um, and uh, give a territorial acknowledgement of your own. Let us know where you're coming from if you'd like to. You can either do that um, with your voice and video or you can just drop it in your chat. But um, Bob, Bob's joining us here from El Guanquan Anishinaabe territory. Thanks, Bob. I'm actually uh, on Hornby Island right now, um, despite the fact that usually I'm on Galliano Island, which is a part of the um, Comox and Pentlatch First Nation. I'll let those stream into the um, chat as you feel so inspired. Feel free to use the chat during this talk to ask questions or give comments, share links or papers. Um, consider it the back channel. You're welcome to, to say anything you would like there. Uh, I'd like to just introduce a little bit about Immerse, the Institute for Multidisciplinary Ecological Research in the Salish Sea. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded to set an example for community-based long-term ecological research in the Salish Sea bioregion. Our vision is to foster a resilient and interconnected bioregion. And our mission is to create capacity for diverse communities to participate in the vision through the practice of observing the natural world and establishing biodiversity baselines to better understand the change that is upon us. Um, this is the sales pitch part of the night. I just want to let you know that we are um, ongoingly fundraising. Um, we use the funds to support our programs. We've got a bunch of awesome programs in the works that we're very proud of. Um, you can learn more about them on our website or on our social media channels. But I would encourage you, if you appreciate the work Elaine's doing or you appreciate what uh, Andrew's up to or any of the different things that we're doing at Immerse, um, please consider making a small or large donation via PayPal, via our website. If you go to immerse.org, you'll see a donate link on the top. And um, we're a tiny little organization. And other than doing, our, doing and delivering our biodiversity programming, we spend most of the rest of the time trying to figure out how to fund it. So to the extent that um, we don't have to worry about how we're gonna fund these things, the more research that gets done and the more stress that is removed from Andrew and Elaine and myself. So please, if you can, make a donation. Okay, as for tonight, um, this is our micro, micro exploration series. Um, in this series, we bring together uh, Elaine Humphrey with various experts to explore a variety of topics in natural history through the means of a scanning electron microscope. These sessions are intended to be participa participatory and open-ended, guided by your observations and questions and the insights of our experts. You're welcome to ask those questions in the chat or use the raise your hand icon or, you know, in an orderly way, feel free to even just blurt out your questions for Elaine. Please don't hesitate to ask or share questions at any point. We're always looking for ideas for new um, subject areas to explore with the microscope with Elaine. So let us know at the end of the presentation if you have a topic you'd like to propose. This evening, we're going to look very closely at bees using a scanning microscope. We'll see many interesting things that are normally invisible to us. I'll ask questions about and our experts will have the opportunity to interpret what's going on. We'll be going on for about an hour. Um, Dr. Elaine Humphrey works as the microscopist at UVic and is a director at Immerse. In her work, she brings together her love for microscopes with a love of marine biology and many, many other topics. Her guest presenter, Bonnie, has been passionate about the world of insects since she was a child and nowadays works as a professional consultant with commercial farmers, helping them to develop more ecologically sustainable pest management practices. She also works in conservation focusing on insect species at risk here in the Gulf Islands. Um, I am going to invite anyone who would like to to introduce themselves at this point, and then we will turn it over to Elaine. So, <laughs> Lori, do you want to introduce yourself? And we can just go from there. Hi, yeah, I'm a co-chair of the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. We're really excited about this event tonight. 
And um, I want to thank Elaine and Bonnie for showing us the bees. If you're interested in our events, we have a website, so check it out. I will put the link in the chat. Thanks, Laurie. Anyone else is free to um, speak up now. If you'd like to introduce yourself or mention why you're here, Lee. Okay. Uh, if you didn't get a chance and you want to, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call you out by name. But with that, I will turn it over to Elaine. Hi, everyone. Uh, great. This, I am quite excited about tonight. And um, uh, I have to show you a PowerPoint. So the way I'm going to do it is an introductory PowerPoint, and then Bonnie's going to take over. And then between Bonnie on a light microscope and me on a SEM, we'll make things work. Hopefully, keep things crossed. Okay, so I need to share my screen. Um, this one. Uh, share screen. Wait a second. Uh, PowerPoint. There we go. And we need to mm, slideshow. Let's do it that way. Okay. Uh, so there are two goals always in my talks. One, no one is to go to sleep. And the second one is we want at least one wow from every member of the audience. And fortunately, with a scanning electron microscope and a light microscope, that's usually not too difficult. So this is a bee feeding on. And they, what I wanted to show you was they wobble. They, when they fly, how they get off the ground, we do not, well, it's, there's a whole website, I think, about how bees can't actually fly, but they do. So the physics is wrong. They do, but they don't do it very easily. Not after you watch a dragonfly fly, because that's something else again. Um, we won't, we'll go to, um, why isn't it going to the next one? Oh, this is another, this is slow-mo. If you've got a camera with slow-mo on it, and you take a film of a bee flying, it is so much fun. You'll love it. Um, why aren't we going to, oh, next one. Now, <laughs> there are a lot of native bees in North America. And Bonnie tells me there's 300 in BC. And she's got most of them in her back in Comox. Uh, we're only gonna see a few of them tonight. As you can imagine, we don't have time to look at all of them, but there are categories, right? And all you have to know is they have an abdomen and a thorax and a head, antenna and six legs and, and, a, and a proboscis and palps and glossa. And you are going both of these, hopefully um, tonight. Now, there's a link here. Now, if I did this right and I go here, it should take me to this link. There we go. And this is a really good link. So the one thing that you wanna know about is how to identify the bees. And if we go to other bees here, there's a whole thing about identifying these bees. Uh, green metallic bee, they have some wonderful common names. Uh, these don't have common names, but if you've got this in front of you, when you go uh, around looking at bees, and these ones are iridescent, and hopefully we can see them. But this, because this is being recorded, you'll be able to go to this website and, and get download that. There is another website that I was told I wasn't supposed to show you because it's only in Europe, but this one is even more, well, when I looked at this, this one it goes into it in a lot more detail. You have lots of parts on a bee. And I thought that was, if you were into bees in a big way, you might want to look at this one. So I wanted to leave that on there. And I think that's all I have in the way. Yes. So I am now going to pass it over to Bonnie. And Bonnie, you can share. Uh, 
uh, more than 300 bees in BC. I think the official tally is something like 483, but we still haven't found them all. I don't have them all in my backyard, much as I wish that I did, but I do have some that I will show you. And I'm gonna see if I can do a little share screen. We have to tell you that Bonnie is using an, an iPhone, a smartphone with a microscope. So you don't need a special camera, you just need a microscope. That is the plan. Let's see if it's gonna go. There we go. So I thought, let's see if this will come up. Can anybody see it yet? Nope, not yet. All right, give it a minute. Oh. Come no. on, phone, you can do it. <laughs> Still nothing, come on. It's working better than this the last time I did it. Well, we, we did actually do a little demo to, to ourselves, but we do it work, so it did work. It did work. I'm trying to do it a little bit differently, but it doesn't seem like, let me just try again. We believe in you, we know it's gonna work. Take your time. So you've got okay. your it looks like the screen sharing is going to take too long so i'm just going to go back to how i used to do it <clears throat> i was trying a new and advanced way but apparently that is too new and advanced so you're taking your iphone and connecting it to your computer. How do you get your iPhone on your computer? I, my iPhone isn't on my computer. My iPhone is on Zoom. So I'm actually here twice. And I, the wrong me is spotlighted right now. We okay. could spotlight the other Bonnie. All right, I'm working. The Bonnie that is a B. <laughs> Give me a <laughs> sec. Bonnie the B. Ah, here's Bonnie the B. Uh, yeah, you can see it on the other, yeah. Hey. Yeah, so if we could unspotlight me that's talking and just spotlight me that is a bee. And then this is actually my microscope on Zoom. So my, my camera is attached to my microscope and my microscope is attached to Zoom and we are looking at a bee. Zoom in a bit here. And it's green. It's it green. Oh. So those, those green metallic sweat bees that you were talking about, Elaine. So this is one of those. Uh, and so as Elaine was saying, you're saying there's a, a huge diversity of bees in British Columbia. And this is one that, that definitely does get a wow. And it's also one that people tend to look at and when they see it on a flower, the first thing that they think is often that it's a fly because we do have this, um, you know, this shiny green fly look to it. But it is indeed a bee. And we can tell that it's a bee because it's actually got these fuzzy pollen carrying hairs. And so that is one of the things you know, we can see them when we look at them on the light microscope. But what I think is going to be really fascinating is to look at some of those pollen carrying structures and hairs under the scanning electron microscope, because we'll be able to see them in so much more detail. Okay. I've got a few of these sweat bees. Why maybe is I'll show, and then we'll swap over to you, Elaine. Does that sound okay. all right? You're going to tell us why it's called a sweat bee? So they're called a sweat bee because these bees 
are known to come and land on people and lick up the sweat. And so they're looking for minerals uh, that they can find in the sweat of people. And I, I will say I have never actually been licked by a sweat bee, possibly because I'm not sweaty enough when I'm out in the field. Uh, has anyone else ever been licked by a sweat bee? And do they sting? So all, bee, all female bees are able to sting, but most of our native bees actually are solitary. And that means that rather than living in a colony like a honeybee or a bumblebee, they each have their own separate nests. And because they each have their own separate nests, although they're capable of stinging, they're really reluctant to do it because bees that sting usually get squished. And so for things like wasps and honeybees and bumblebees, where they're protecting a colony, a worker bee might come out and be willing to give up its life to protect the queen and the other bees. But for solitary bees, where each, each bee is both the queen and all the workers, if she goes out and gets killed protecting her nest, well, now there's nothing left. You know, she, she's died. And so they'll sting, they'll sting you if you do something, like, like you're pinching them, but they're not really going to just come out and go after you. So then this is the female, and she can sting, but she probably won't. This one here is the male of the same species. So I just wanted to show you those really amazing colors that you can see on them. And then I've got one here. This is actually the one that um, Elaine's got under her microscope. And so this is a really common sweat bee. So this is Helictus rubicundus, and it's a super common um, bee that we'll see around. It's got these cool stripes on its back, and it's got these cool pollen-carrying areas that you might be able to see. see if I can point to them here. Right here, there's some funky hairs that come out and form a little bit of a basket, and I'm sorry that the focus isn't very good here. Uh, it's because of the iPhone, not because of the light microscope, but we, we struggle to get the focus exactly where we want it with this thing. There's those hairs. And so we can see if we can have a look at those with Elaine. And before we look at those, there's one more sweat bee I wanted to show you. Oh, there we go. And so I just wanted to show you this one because it's Bitty, bitty, bitty. I'm gonna up the focus so it'll focus on it better. There we go. So there's that one. And that is also a sweat bee. And so you can see just how tiny it is. You can see some of the letters behind it. I'll put the head of a pin in here for you too. There's the head of a pin. So that, that's your, uh, your size reference for this teeny little bee. So just to give you an idea of just how variable some of these are. Elaine, did you want us to have a look at, at the one you've got under the scanning microscope and we can have a look and see what sort yep. of pollen collecting hairs we've got on there and other sorts of structures? So if you stop sharing yours. I just unspotlight me. I'm just spotlighted. I'm not actually screen sharing. Okay, I got it. Okay, then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna share this screen. So in theory, you should all see my SEM. I'm gonna, so how you work with an SEM, you can all hear me back there, is we press the start button and we just wait for the beam to come on. Now, the more sophisticated the microscope, the easier it is to use. And there is the bum of the bee and it's out of focus. So all I do is take the reduce window and if we want that bit in focus, we can go auto focus and then a slow scan. And there is our abdomen and it's got lots of hairs on it. Wow. Got stuff on it. So I'm going to go, this is slow scan. 
Um, you can see this. I don't think I've ever been to a microscope workshop where Elaine doesn't show a bee's butt. <laughs> no, it's usually an ant's butt. Well, that's true. I stand corrected. Ant's butts are more pretty. Um, but <laughs> okay, so the hairs, let's just do an autofocus on the whole thing. You see the hairs are, ah, we've got depth of field here. So these hairs are very heavily sculptured. Ah, we're in the wrong place. It's trying to focus too much. I'll just do it manually. And they've got all kinds of projections on them, right? Now, we were going to find this. Ah. Oh, now, this is where I have to apologize immediately because um, I, had give, I was given all these pristine um, um, specimens on pins and I put them onto a stub and then I have to move them onto another stub and they didn't like that and they all broke up but we have enough of them to work with. But except, no, we've lost the back legs. So we oh. Those hairs. Um, at the moment. Oh, but zoom, zoom in on some of those hairs there, Elaine. Those look like they'll be really nice and, and fuzzy and hairy and good for collecting and holding pollen. So you can see it's out of focus. So we just press the auto focus button, which makes life very much easier. And then a slow scan. And this tells you why it's called a scanning electron microscope, because the specimen doesn't move and the detector doesn't move. It's the beam that moves across in the raster fashion. Hairs. But these are interesting hairs. There isn't much pollen on this one, though. What was that? But, the, but because it's slow, you have to go back to fast if you want to move in real time. Uh, let's just see what that is. Whoops, too far. Now, this particular microscope is the stage is controlled with these knobs on the front. They gave me a minimalist microscope. So I got this microscope to take it. Oh, look at that sculpturing. Not cool. But I was wondering what this was, but I think it's just a, it's not anything. Take the reduced window. The reduced window allows me to focus on a particular part. Just check that out. No, I don't think it's anything. Okay, but these th these hairs have, oh, this one's broken off. But if we zoom in on it, oh, let's move it. Uh, it's a bit like, wait a minute. I, I, and this is a wheel controlled microscope. So the wheel, if you, you turn the wheel one way, you go up and you turn the wheel down and you go the other way. So if I move that down a little bit and move it across, and I see a lot of skull, oh yeah. So it's got grooves in it. And I think some of the others have more sculpturing in them. These are kind of cool. Um, was there anything else I wanted to see on this? Uh, abdomen hairs. No, because it lost its legs, poor thing. Oh, there is some pollen. Let's have a look at the pollen. I have to move it over. It's a bit like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. Um, working with this one. Well, those are interesting. We'll take the reduced window. And these are different. So I've looked at some of the other pollen, and you'll find out these are different. Well, look at that. So when you want to take a photograph, you just go to save. So we're going to save this picture. I suppose if we're recording this, we don't have to take all the pictures every time. Ah, but you might as well save them. I'd like to have them for like our Instagram promo and stuff like that. So if you want to save them, send them to me. Sure. But you can see it takes about the same time as the slow scan. So this pollen is very different from the other pollens I've seen on this stub. It's like, what are those Indian, um, little Indian pockets of meat? Samosas? The most, no, no, not, no, samosas are more, tr tr well, yeah, that could be a samosa, almost. Oh, but there's another pollen, a different one. Aha. And there's a different pollen again. Wow. The 
three different pollens. Yeah, so this bee is actually a, a generalist bee. It'll visit many different sorts of flowers to collect different kinds of pollen. Uh, so we should probably see, you know, we'd expect to see a number of different kinds of pollen on this one. So I'll put it in a minute folder, we'll call it in this. Can we look? Can we look closer at one of those grains of pollen, Elaine? We can. So that's what Halle Victus. Is that right? No, I, uh, Halle Victus. No, it's Halle Ictus. Right? Halictus. Like that? Halle Ictus. Uh, yes, I think that's right. I can't quite see it well. Oh, you can't? Oh. It's just the words are a little small. I'm getting it's old, my eyesight's going. You, you're you going to be uh, experts at using an SEM by the end of the evening, because you can see in the top left-hand corner, it says freeze. <clears throat> and when you take a picture, it freezes the image. So you have to unfreeze it by clicking on the fast button at the top. And then you can zoom in. Oh, why don't we zoom in on these guys? Okay. Yeah, That's one of the little cantaloupes. More interesting one, isn't it? So let's. Ooh. And let's take the reduced window. Wow. Maybe on to that one. We'll go autofocus. And we'll take that picture. That's kind of cool. By the time this is finished, we could have a book of pollen. Because I know there's a lot of different kinds of pollen in this stub on the bees. Yeah, this is a great way to find out what the different bees are foraging on. That's right. What I usually say to the kids uh, when we look at pollen is if you want to know what it was like here 2000 years ago, you go to the nearest bog and you dig to the 2000 year level. And if you look at the pollen, that will tell you what species lived here. And if you say maybe they like the same conditions then as now, you know what the environment was like here 2000 years ago. We used to say 10,000 years ago, but then we found, no, wait a minute, that's not a good time for pollen. We were under a mile of ice. There's not a lot of pollen when you're under a mile of ice. Um, <clears throat> so it's 2000 years ago. And um, that is kind of cool. Yeah, 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 something else that's cool is that we could also take some bees, we could go to a museum and find bees collected from the same locations and look at them from a couple hundred years ago and see what kind of pollen they were collecting then and see how their pollen um, relationships have changed, if they're still collecting the same kinds of pollen today or if they've change to using different plants? Pollen can tell us so many cool things. Well, before we leave this guy, we'll just have a look at the pollen, and see if it's the same, it looks the same. Yeah. I noticed that those hairs that the pollen's trapped under look different than those ones with the bifurcations on it. Like, it seems like it's got at least two kinds of hairs. Oh, I think it's got more than two. Well, some of the bees have definitely got more than two. Uh, and we'll definitely see those later. Some of them are really heavily sculptured. But you have to think, these hairs are also sensory. So if you, a bee is an insect, right? And so it means all its squidgy stuff is on the inside and its hard stuff is on the outside. In us, our hard stuff is on the inside and our squidgy stuff is on the outside. But if you live in a box like the bees do, they still need to know whether they're going into hot or cold, rain or dry. They need to find the mate. They need to find the food. They need all these other sensory things. So all these hairs very often are sensory. And a lot of them are um, sensitive to air movement. So they can know whether they're going into the wind or across the wind and the like. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing here and we can go to the next sample. So back to you, Bonnie. Sure, all right. Uh, so we, 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 may, we may have had a mix up on our sample, but I, Bonnie shows me the next one's a Mason bee. 
That's right. And I've got a Mason bee right here. Let me zoom in on that one a little bit. My uh, setup is not as cool as Elaine. I cannot just click it and get it to autofocus. I have to try and trick my iPhone into focusing on what I want it to. Someday I'll have a scanning microscope, but not yet. Someday everybody will have a scanning microscope in their kitchen. Or exactly. So this one, this one is the Mason bee. And it's pretty awesome. It's got this beautiful coloration for starters. If we just want to look at something really pretty, you see the metallicness there. What? But this one is also different from the ones we were looking at previously. So the sweat bees are interesting because they're carrying their pollen mostly on their legs. Whereas this bee, so it's part of the family Megachylidae. And the Megachylidae are also known as the hairy belly bees. And you can kind of see why here. You can see all underneath her abdomen. Oh, there, now you can see it. Yeah. All uh, the hairs, and they're full of pollen on this one. And so an interesting feature of this bee compared to the last one, the sweat bees that we were looking at mostly nest in the ground. And so they're digging a burrow and they're digging it more or less as wide as they want it to be. But these mason bees and some of the leaf cutter bees we're gonna be looking at are tunnel nesting bees. And so that means that they're going to be nesting in a tunnel they find somewhere, maybe a hollow stem, maybe a, a beetle tunnel in the wood. And so they can't necessarily decide how big that tunnel is gonna be. So it might be a tight, squeezed. And so you could perhaps imagine that if you had pollen sticking out on your legs out to the side of you and you were squeezing through a tight space, it might get knocked off. Whereas if you've got your pollen kind of tucked up under your body on your belly, you might be a little bit more of a concentrated package and more of that pollen might make it through the tight squeeze without getting scraped off. And so that's one theory for why these tunnel nesting bees also carry their pollen underneath their abdomen. Oh, and this one, it's also got its tongue stuck out. And so you can see here, this is a long tongued bee. And so you can see it's got a very long curly. So the bees in this family, let's see if I can get it to focus. There that we go. Long tongue. It's a very long tongue, but a lot of the bees that are the hairy belly bees or the mega kelidae bees have really interesting faces and they've got big jaws and they're often specialized to do different things. And in the case of the mason bee, it's got this sort of scoop on the front of its face and it uses its jaws and its scoop to scoop up and carry mud, which is what it's using to build walls around its nest inside those little hollow tunnels, the, the stems and the, the beetle tunnels, it segments them off using mud. And so it's got specialized to carry some of that mud. And I think, I think, Elaine, I think we saw some mud on the jaws of the one on the SEM. Did we wanna go to the SEM and see if we can see are some of those structures okay so i'm going to start sharing this screen again okay and spotlight me okay so uh we're frozen so we're going to go to fast i'm going to zoom out and then move the specimen to the next specimen oh um i'm kind of interested in this spike that they all seem to have on their legs because they're all different. Sorry. And you can see it's out of focus. So by now you'll know you go to the autofocus button. And it's got, it's got a comb, a, a really interesting comb and a pattern. It's like a, the pattern's like a, maybe a, a lizard skin, I thought. I have to, no, we have to take that picture. We, we have to take that picture. 
because that is kind of cool. And, and they're all different, these spikes. Yeah, those, those are the tibial spurs on the back leg of the bee. And they can be important in identification for some groups of bees, looking at the different patterns of spikes and teeth on the tibial spurs. So yeah, that's pretty cool. I haven't ever looked at a, a mason bee's tibial spur in, in close up. So that is very cool. I wonder what it's using it for. It looks like it'd be combing something, maybe combing some pollen out of somewhere. Combing is for combing pollen. Yeah, that's it is kind of cool. And I guess that sort of like begs the question, is it combing the pollen out of the flower onto itself or off of itself and into somewhere else? Off of itself, off of all the other parts and putting it into a package. Cool. And you can see there's a couple of pollen grains here that are different from the ones we've seen so far. Okay, now this isn't honey ictus. Comes with its I'm own grooming it. kit. I'm just gonna call it Mason B. For now, because uh, I can spell that. Okay, that was fast. Uh, we, we do have pollen on this leg. Lots of it. Cool. And it's different. That's almost like um, uh, a lily pollen. So now you see, now it leads, oh, one thing leads to another all the time. So now I've got to find an expert in pollen to tell me what this is. So we'll save this one. Didn't Tyler do a lot of work identifying pollen? Where's Tyler? Tyler? Isn't there a Tyler in the Native Bee Society? He was in, he was in. I, at least I think he studied pollen. Oh, yeah, the okay. <clears throat> and you can see the sculpturing on this hair. Huh. Mm -hmm. Not as pronounced as some hairs, but we'll see. But that's kind of cool. That's a beautiful pollen grain. It's got a reticulate pattern on it. So I saw someone was asking in the chat whether or not um, pollen would change uh, on bees within a couple of years, or sorry, a couple of hundred years. I want to say that, you know, we're probably not going to see a change in evolutionary relationships with plants, but we might see a change in what plants are present. So we might see that there's, you know, been introduced species come in. And we could actually sort of see, well, when do the bees start using them? When does that pollen start showing up on the bees versus, um, you know, maybe some other species that either they disappear from a site or an area, or maybe the bees stop using them and actually swap to a different species. So we can learn lots of cool things from pollen. Ooh, there's the jaws. Wow. They're heavy duty jaws, aren't they? Um, oh, let me just, just yeah. an autofocus. <laughs> I have to say the autofocus is pretty cool. They have lots of cool joints as well. And it's a grayscale image. And people say, well, why isn't it colored? And that's because we're using electrons. <clears throat> and our eyes can see the colors of the rainbow. And a rainbow is just splits the white light into all its different wavelengths. And the only difference between green and blue and red is a wavelength. And if you, in, in the early days, when they used artificial lenses, people that got them said they could see another color 
and our retina can see UV. Uh, oh, no, let's see. Yeah. So let's have a look in this jaw. Um, but if you've ever tried to tell somebody what red looks like, it's very difficult. And it's got some particles in it, but you can see the autofocus and we just do an autofocus on it. Well, it's pollen, but then I think this is mud. It looks kind of like little bits of mud. What is this? What? Uh, it, it quite possibly is mud with bits because those are the the mud scooping the mud scooping mandibles okay so this is the tongue right yeah so the tongue you've got two kind of sheaths there on the side and then you've got the bit down the center uh, and so it, it kind of can close those sheaths around it to make a tube and then the tip at the end uh, will kind of come out there's probably a bunch of hairs on it. It does have a lot, bunch of hairs on it. So how do they suck the nectar up? Is this a tube? So no, the, the two, the, that bit there, the two white bits on the side will kind of form kind of close around the bits in the middle to form a tube okay. and then it can, it can kind of stick it out and then the, I think the, the hairs on the middle bit will kind of hold on to the pollen I'm sorry hold on to the nectar yeah. and then they'll kind of pull that part put it in and out of the nectar and, and pull the the nectar up with the hairs it's got another bit at the back yeah yeah so those extra the palps at the back there will probably also form the bottom of the tube and then the bit in the middle is going to be sticking out although i haven't really spent a lot of time staring at bees on high magnification while they're using their tongues so if somebody else wants to jump in and explain the exact mechanics of it feel free yeah there's the hairs Take this one. Just get a better focus. Elaine, are there scanning electron microscopes that can do video? Um, we're doing video. Uh -huh. yes. yes, you just have to have an NTS, an NTCS outlet. Um, this looks like it's got stuff on it that's. And these hairs are flat. They don't look like they've got sculpturing on them. Interesting. Hmm. So I was telling you, and, and you get, well, this is all scanning down because we get to chat about other things, like why our retinas can see this other color, but the other color was UV. And the trouble with UV is it's dangerous to the back of your eye. So our lenses filter it out. Um, and all the lenses they use now have the filter in them. But there are animals that use UV, um, snakes and a lot of insects will use UV for all kinds of things. <clears throat> Mind you, snakes can also uh, log, log into uh, infrared as well. And that's a whole nother story. But bees, I'm pretty sure, do infrared as well, don't they? Uh, not the UV, not the infrared. Not infrared, okay. Uh, do we want, oh, uh, Mason, it won't let me, it, it adds, I can use the same name and it adds the magnification on the end. So I will call this A. Uh, so if I move that down, down well, it's tips got covered in stuff. Oh. Not terribly interesting, but this bit at the back is. Look at that. There's that, that lizard skin. Uh, let me do this one. I'm going to zoom in a bit.
Let me take his picture. So this looks like it's got three or four things wrapping around this central part. Yeah, it, it'll have the, um, the two blades on the top and then two of the palps on the bottom that'll form a little sheath. And it'll be able to open that up like it is now. Right now it's not enclosed around it. There's some more sculpturing on this hair sticking out. They're like little plates, like on a on a um, on a shark skin, maybe, or a fish scale, fish scales. <laughs> Nature repeats itself where it, where it works. <laughs> okay. Um, and the other thing we'll talk about is the scale bar. Let me see. Okay, we got that one. All right. So, um, yeah. Lots of odd things. So it's got a, it's very hairy around its mouth. Yeah, we're looking at it upside down here. So we're looking at the underside of its chin. Yeah. And there's more of these wispy hairs. Yeah. Oh, and pollen. More, part, more of its pollen. Do the hairs look the same on its belly? Have a look. Just let me check. While we're here on its chin, we'll just check what these are. Autofocus. That's almost daisy pollen, which you do know. No. Okay. Okay. So, oh, it's got on the edge. It's got it's like the spike on its leg. All right, let's go to its belly. And, and there's its claws. What this leg has still got its claw. Has it got three claws? I I'm not sure what that that spike coming out the back is. So those are the tarsal claws, and it'll have those on each foot. Uh, and so it should have two claws, and then there's a little uh, sticky pad in the middle. Well, but that there's a big long spike coming out, and I wonder if that isn't something else. Um, a part of a different bee. Yeah, maybe. So here's its belly. <laughs> wow. You can see all the hair is down there and all lined up. Shove pollen into those. So we'll do autofocus. <clears throat> you want to see the belly of a mason, a mason bee? There again. Hmm. And it's full of pollen. Wow. Well, it's not completely full. Um, not like the one uh, Bonnie showed us. <coughs> well, they actually, they, they do look different. We'll just take this Lomac picture and then we'll zoom in a bit more. Looks like it has one of my beard hairs trapped in its hairs there. <laughs> ah, no, no, your beard hair is triangular. Actually, you should give me some and I'll show you. Your beard hair is triangular and your head hair is round. You're gonna tell me I end up looking like one of those wool dogs you study. <laughs> well, what one of the, um, First Nations blankets had human hair in it. It had 29 colors and one of them was black and it was human hair. Um, yeah, so these are the same sort of hairs, uh, same sort of pollen as we've seen before. Let's just see a bit more. 
Wow. See the hair as well. Oops. Oh, come on. This is like, yeah, up, up, we're going to there. One of the things I'm always shocked about when we look at this stuff is how much like certain things in nature just look like other things in nature. So this looks like we're looking at like blood cells or platelets or something. It also reminds me of seeing like corals under under the sea and the Indian Ocean that have been like washed out and stuff, leaving structures like this. It's it's amazing how much uh, uniformity or consistency there is across species. Well, I'll, I'll take this picture, but the beam has power. And the electrons that we're using are wobbling this uh, hair around and it's become, it's not a good picture. Hmm. I might abandon this one, we'll see. Oh, well, no, the pollen's showing up, but the hairs are waving a bit. So we're coming back to color and grayscale. If you can shorten the wavelength, you get higher resolution. So when I talk to the kids about wavelength, when we talk about Superman, he can see what x-rays are is a different wavelength. So his eyes can see x-rays. Well, oh no, it's all, it's all um, waving about. So it's got these scan lines on it. Oh dear, Never mind. We'll find somewhere that's a bit more stable. I think even the pollen just moved. Hmm. We're only at a thousand times. Ah, uh, well, let's find a different area. Let's see. So, well, there's a big pollen there. Or maybe it's not a pollen. There's some sculpturing on that hair. Let's just remove it. Now we'll take our reduced window so we can hopefully get it to focus on that hair. There we go. We do need an auto brightness contrast though. There we go. Uh, or I might as well take its picture even if it does not scan right. If it's going to scan down anyway, you might as well be taking his picture, right? So um, I think Pam's in, in the room. And when I look with Pam at slime mold spores, they often look a lot like this, but they're a bit smaller. So on the scale bar at the bottom, it says 50 micrometers. So if you take a millimeter and divide it by a thousand, you have a micrometer and a bacterium is one to five micrometers. This is divided into tenths. So from one bar to the next bar is a tenth of 50, so it's five micrometers. So that would be the size of a bacterium. So these are huge. I've got one, two, three, four, three to four, so 15, 20. Uh, no. What are we looking at there? What's that thing going horizontally, diagonally? That's one of its hairs. I'll zoom out so you can see. So this is one of its hairs. So not heavily sculptured. And not particularly branched either. So it's obviously oh. just packing the pollen in there. It's not a hair at all. It's one of those fibers that it picked up. Not a hair at all. Well, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? But, you know, interesting. So let's move into this group here. Let's zoom in here. Ah, that's better. This one's more sculptured. Oops. Let me move over just a little bit so I can zoom in a bit more and we can get that focus properly. Oh, well, it didn't like that, did it? So we have to do it manually.
So it's, you can do it manually with the mouse, but it's a lot easier. So these are sculpture. Well, well, we'll take that picture. Well, this is a high, this is lower magnification. So this button is now back 100 micro, oh, 100 micrometers. So that's 10 micrometers from there to there. Uh, hmm. So a human hair is about 30 micrometers ish. So that's 10, 10 20, 30. So a human hair would be uh, about three times the thickness of that. Okay, so there is some sculpturing. All right. Um, but there's a different bee that's called a hairy belly bee, isn't there? Well, the hairy belly bee, there's, there's that's a whole group of bees. Oh. So we have a bunch that are, are known as hairy belly bees um, because they all have those hairs on their bellies that they use to carry hairy pollen. Is this a hairy belly bee? This is a hairy belly bee and it's also a mason bee. Okay. And I think the next one we were gonna look at is also a hairy belly bee, but it's not a mason bee, it's a leaf cutter bee. Okay, back to you then. All right, if someone wants to spotlight me, I've got her here. On my way. There we go. So you can see this is the leaf cutter bee. And you can see again, we've got these hairs underneath the abdomen. And that yellow color, there is some pollen in there. But that's also just the color that her hairs are. She's got these beautiful golden hairs underneath her abdomen. And again, we can see she's got this lovely long tongue. And she's got these beautiful big jaws. And so this one, leaf cutter bee. And so the mason bee uses mud to seal and create nest cells. While the leaf cutter bee uses pieces of leaves. And so she's going to use her jaws like scissors to cut out big chunks of leaves that fly home with. And you can actually, sometimes you can see a little piece of leaf flying through the air and it may have a leaf cutter bee attached to it. And this is the female. And we know she's a female because she's got hairs for carrying pollen. The male bees don't carry pollen, but they're pretty awesome. And we don't want under this SEM, but I thought I should bring one of these guys over for you to see as well because there's his belly and you can see it doesn't have much for hairs in it but he's got this other special structure and so if we look at the front legs here there we go. he's got these big expanded front legs and he's gonna, you can see there's white bits and they've got a bunch of hair on them. And he actually holds them often, kind of, just like he's holding them now, crossed in front of his face. And he'll use them when he's mating with the female. They've got this big expanded area and he'll actually put them on her face, cover her face with these new, beautiful front legs. Uh -huh. And he's also got that nice long tongue that you can see there sticking way out. So he wouldn't feed on pollen then, would he? He might eat a little bit of pollen and you'll probably find a bit of pollen on him because he will definitely visit flowers, but he won't collect pollen. So the collecting pollen is to take it home and feed it to the offspring. But the male bee does not do any work like that. Uh, collecting pollen is only for females. Eating pollen, yeah, the male will do that. And of course he will eat a lot of nectar. 
So and we'll I, also be, be visiting flowers because that's where the females are. And so some species of bees, the males will actually have a little territory staked out where they'll have their patch of flowers and they'll protect it just for their girls. And nobody else is allowed to come and check out those flowers. And so that's this guy. He's pretty awesome. But they might be mated with another bee. How What's is that? he? Well, if he's if he's keeping his territory for his girls, his girls might wander off with other. They might. So yeah, I guess he has to pick a really nice patch of flowers. You know, I don't, I'm not sure how a bee decides what the best patch of flowers that's going to increase your mating chances the most is. You must have some kind of strategy. Say so these these are the flowers that will be the most attractive to the females. Huh. There's uh, some work being done on birds and birds that nest, um, songbirds that nest where the female goes off and joins several different males. So the eggs in the nest turn out to have several male partners. In that species, the testes are huge. Whereas in a species of bird where they're monogamous and they only have one mate, the testes apparently are very small. Interesting. This guy does happen to have his, um, his boy bits sticking out. So <laughs> if you want to have a look at those, there we go. This is not, uh, not for children. <laughs> There's the male genitalia. Huh. Most of the time those are, are firmly inside, except for when he's mating, but uh, I think I pulled them out on this guy a little bit. For some bees, uh, it's uh, the male genitalia can be really important for learning to differentiate between species. It what looks we... like a wrench. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a grappling hook. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. all a little bit different. And presumably it matches something inside the female bees. Is there three little apparatuses there? So he's got, he's got kind of two prongs on the side and then a, a bit in the center. Weird. Coming out. Yeah, and they'll all be different. And so with the leaf cutting bees, the males all also just look different because they've got a lot of interesting external structure. But for some things like bumblebees, it can be really hard to differentiate the males unless you pull their genitals out. And then their genitals, even if their bodies look identical to other male bees, their genitals will look different if they're a different species. Wow. A bit like how spiders have the lock and the key, so only one species will mate with one species. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they match up. So I, I didn't send Elena mail. Sorry, Elena. I think you've just got a female mason, or sorry, a female leaf cutter bee. Okay. Well, that's all right. We can find if we find a spot where that goes. Um, it's a, it's five minutes past eight. Are we all good to carry on? Well, Bonnie, are you good to carry on? I can stay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have a look at the leaf cutter bee then. So I wish. Our time was just an estimate. If anyone needs to drop off, that's totally fine. We're recording the whole thing and we'll post it to YouTube. So if you have to leave, you're not going to miss anything. Just feel free to drop off. And thank you very much for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to move over to this guy. Oh, the other thing was eyes. The eyes of bees are different. We lost the end of his antenna. Yeah. Well, that was my fault. So, I, I see I've already sidetracked to eyes. <laughs> we can sidetrack a lot. So this is not hairy. Honeybee eyes are hairy. This one is not hairy. We do an auto brightness contrast. Um, and there's, there's some on this stub. It's called a stub, what we put the samples on to put into the microscope. And some of them have hairy, I know one of them has very hairy eyes. Now we've got two different kinds of bees with hairy eyes. There's honeybees that have hairy eyes. And there's also a parasitic bee called Celioxus. And that one also has hairy eyes. Yeah, we have one of those. 
It's somewhere on the stem. Oh, that's lots of sculpturing at the back here. Huh. And there's pollen on this eye. But, but really, we want to look at the jaws on this one, don't we? So we can have a look at the teeth. Yep, the, the abdomen with the hairs will probably look quite similar to the, the mason bee. But we could see if they, we can see a difference in the teeth. Oh, and the, there's different pollen on the tongue. Uh, this is not a mason bee. This is leaf cutter. All right. Um, so these jaws here. Oh, look at that tongue. Yes, you can see it sticking out and curling around. And you can see some of the, the joints. So with some of these bees with the long tongues, their tongues actually fold up like a Z and tuck under their chins. So they're not flying around with their tongue sticking out, getting in the way. And they're just tucking them up under their chin. And then when they get to a flower, they'll flip it out and then they can drink. Okay. Look at all the nice hairs on that. And spiky pollen. Yes. Hmm. It looks almost like a concertina's. Got lots of ridges. But yeah. And hairs on it, so it's sensory. Sensory hairs. I suppose if you well, I don't know. It if the tongue if the tongue's got chitin on the outside, then it needs to still be able to sense stuff. But if it's just soft and squidgy, oh. Well, yeah, there's, so there's some spiky pollen. And another type there. Oh, maybe that's just mud. And these are sculptured. They've got ridges on them. Oh. Leaf cutter bee. Sock. Um, yeah. uh, so there behind there, you can see the, the underside of one side of the jaw and you can see all the little teeth on it. And so that's what she'll use. She'll use that with the other one to slice bits of leaf. I don't know if we can see any, any vegetation bits attached to it. Possibly not. Leaves aren't quite as messy as mud. Still looks like she needs a toothbrush. Why? Oh, yeah. Let's just zoom in now. Let's try that autofocus again. Oh, it's having a hard time autofocusing. Why would that be so? That's better. There we go. Oh, bitches. All sorts of stuff on this bit. Bits of stuff. Pollen? Maybe other pollens. So with a scanning electron microscope, you only see surfaces. You don't see color and texture, which is why the light microscope is still important. Oh, this pollen looks like it's covered in stuff. Maybe it's sap from the leaf. It could be, yeah. She, she definitely looks like she has very dirty mandibles. Yeah. And that's an interesting crack running down it there. They, they do wear their teeth out. These leafcutter bees, the, the teeth are quite important for identifying them to species, 
But if you get an old one, she'll have chewed so many leaves that her teeth all the, the be worn right down and you won't be able to tell what bee she is because you can't look at her teeth nicely. And so she may be, she may be in the process here. She's starting to have some wear and tear on those teeth. Well, um, honeybees only last about three weeks, don't they, in the main season? So would these last a bit longer? Leaf cutter bees as adults, so honeybees, I think they go about six weeks as adults, but they don't spend all of that time outside of the hive. They spend the first three weeks inside their hive and then the last three weeks out as foragers, which is, is the hardest part. Uh, the leaf cutter bees will probably be about the same, that they last about six weeks as adults. And we find that with a lot of our solitary bees, that in the spring, the mason bees will come out, we'll have mason bees for about six weeks, and then all the adults die. Later in the season, the leaf cutter bees come out, we'll have adult leaf cutter bees for a while, and then all those adults will die. And then the rest of the year, while they are not adults, we've got these bees in their home somewhere, in the cells that they've made out of mud or leaves as eggs and larvae and pupa. And so they're still somewhere, but we just don't see the adults flying. So here's one of the wings with its hooks. So with bees, the hind wing hooks into the front wing. So the wings flap together. Whereas if you see a dragonfly fly, all the wings are separate. I think these hooks are kind of cool. How does the wing form the hooks when it's developing? That is so specialized. The, the hooks are forming away from us. It's got wow. bits in it. Are we going to take a look at those little bits? Maybe nothing. So what's that? 500 micrometers. So that would be 50. I suppose it could be bacteria. Well, we'll have a look. We still on the leaf cutter? Yes, we are. So let's put that in the middle. Oops. Just these little baby keys. Oh, I don't know. Maybe just garbage. Okay, not anything special. Now you can see the wear and tear on the wing there as well. Yeah. That's something else you can, you can, if you get a bee and you think, is this a fresh young bee or an old bee? You can look for that, that wear and tear on the, the teeth, but also that wear and tear on the wing. See how she's slowly tattering it to bits. Okay, the next one I have is Hariadi, Hari, Hariades, Hariades, and see there's its spines. See they've got and lots of different other kinds of pollen. Oh, good ones. That's very odd. That's good. Let's do it there. Um, I think we just need a photo of that in this contrast. Yeah. We have to take this one. This would have been a lot faster to do if we hadn't been taking pictures, I assume. But that's really cool. That that's one. very interesting, Colin. Wow. These ones are almost like a daisy pollen. But this, this is a different kind of pollen, if it's a pollen. And look at that sculpturing on that, like a unicorn horn and feathery ones. There's another one of those. Very cool. Wow. So she's been visiting a lot of plants. Yes. So we've obviously got another pollen generalist here.
I see that Brenda's asking, uh, were these bees collected at different times of year and in different different places? So yes, uh, these were all collected on Vancouver Island around the vicinity of the Comox Valley, uh, but they were not all collected at the same time. So we would not see mason bees and leafcutter bees both out at the same time of year. And so they'll be collecting different pollen, both because they have different pollen preferences, but also because there's just different pollen available depending on the time of year. Um, in the interest of time, because time is getting away from us, I wanna to go to the parasitic bee. Sure, let's skip over to the parasitic bees. Um, I'll stop sharing here. And I'll move All right. While you're talking, I'll move this over. Okay, so Elaine has a Helioxus parasitic bee on hers. And I actually have a selection of parasitic bees that I pulled out of my collection to show you. And so the first thing we should probably talk about is what on earth is a parasitic bee? And these bees don't collect their own pollen. And so one of the things you're gonna notice and that we can look at at this parasitic bee that Elaine will have is that they don't have those same abundant pollen collecting hairs. And that's because they're not collecting pollen. Instead, they search for the nest of another bee that is collecting pollen. Wait until she's not looking, and then they'll actually nip into her nest, and they will lay their eggs on the pollen that the other bees have collected. And so they manage to get away with not doing any of the work, but still having their offspring survive. And so either their babies or um, the adult parasitic bee will kill the egg or the larva of the host bee, and then their baby will grow in its place. And they're really interesting ones. There's a lot of interesting colors, um, not really hairy bees, but they've got these, these interesting cotton hairs. I mean, Maybe not, they should be called cuckoo bees. They are called cuckoo bees. That would be another name for them. So here's one. This is a triepiolus. And you can see it, it isn't super fuzzy. Like these bees are often mistaken for wasps, but it's got these really interesting black hair patterns. We've got this one here. And so this one is called a nomada bee. And so these are parasites on mining bees. How do you tell the difference between the last one and a wasp? It does have branched hairs. Even though when you look at it, it looks quite hairless. If we looked with the scanning electron microscope, we would be able to find branched hairs. And that's how the, the definitive characteristic that determines is it a bee or is it a wasp, is the presence of those branched hairs. Okay. So we'll have to look for it on, on the other one. Let's see who else is. This is the male of the Celioxus, the bee that Elaine has. I think this is one of the ones with uh, hairy eyeballs. And the one Elaine has, the end of the abdomen is super long and tapered, which is great for breaking into other bees' nest cells and laying your egg. But the male, the male has this uh, spikes on the end. And so a lot of these parasitic bees are interesting that they have a lot of um, extra spines and they're often much more sculptured and punctured on their body and, and often have much kind of thicker skin because they're going to get attacked. They're breaking into other bees' nests. And so rather than having specialized structures for collecting pollen, they've got specialized structures for not getting beat up by other bees and for breaking into other nest cells. Yep. Did you want to look at the, the one uh, you've got in the scanning microscope already? Okay. You can All right. see the hairy eyeballs on this guy and the extra sculpturing. There we go.
her from the underside, you can see how pointed the end of her abdomen is and also how, how sculptured and punctured her body is. Little short hairs. But they're still branched. So you can see that we do still have those branched hairs, even though this bee, just like those male bees, isn't going to be collecting and, and carrying pollen, as she does still have those branched hairs. That's part of her evolutionary heritage. She's got lots of little pores on her abdomen as well. Oh, and a mm -hmm. spiky pollen. And there's something else, maybe pollen, that she's probably picked up in the nest somewhere. Yeah. And she'll be visiting flowers. She'll eat pollen herself and she'll drink nectar. But she just doesn't carry it. Yeah. So you won't ever see her flying around with a pollen load like you will with the, the mason bees and the leaf cutter bees and the sweat bees. Like little hands sticking out here. Yeah? Like, help me, help me. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just call it parasitic bee. Okay. Um, okay, we, we just have to go and see its eye. Now, when I moved this one, its head fell off, unfortunately. But when I go up, it's got a very raggedy wing. Yes, yeah, so again, we're looking at an old bee here. But um, his head fell off, but his head is here. And his eyes are very hairy. Now, when the school kids ask me, why is it so hairy? The answer is, maybe you'll be the scientist to find out. And that is our standard answer when we don't know. We can hypothesize. Uh, what do I want to do? Autofocus. So scan. An auto brightness contrast. And, and take its picture. <laughs> hmm. What's that? Hmm. Oh, that's, that's one of the other bees. But I think in the... <laughs> In the interest of time, uh, we better make this the last one. So many bees, so little time. Yeah. And I'm sorry you just missed having all the fun that I had this afternoon checking out these bees. Uh, maybe uh, we'll have to do the one with a different set of bees. Because it doesn't matter. It's all, look at it's got spiky pollen on its head. But these, that's definitely a hairy eyeball. And, and these some are, of those hairs are branched too. That's pretty neat. That is very cool. Okay, parasitic bee, yes. Okay, um, so I, we really, we really have to let people go home. <laughs> oh, they are home. Wait a minute. Um, yes. I'm the only one that's not home. Oh, but look at its legs. No, this is the one above, isn't it? That's not the, no, that's not the parasitic one. And there's, oh, look at this tongue. That's cool. Hmm. Oh, Bonnie, you've got to send me some new specimens, complete specimens that I haven't, I haven't broken. That is a very hairy tongue. Hairy very eye. hairy. Let's take that one. And, and this bee is related to the leaf cutter and the mason bees. And so even though it doesn't have all the hairs on its belly for collecting pollen, it does still have a, a pretty decent jaw on it. <laughs> Yeah, it's still kind of beefed up there.
Well, that's cool. Okay, this we'll make this the last picture then. Oh, that was fun, Bonnie. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, specimens. That was great. You've got you've got to share these photos with me, Elaine. I want to see all the photos you took. Okay. Um, so the video will go on the YouTube because Chris will see to that, won't you, Chris? Yeah, that's right. And I'll have the video posted tomorrow morning and I'll send the link around. Um, I'll send you before you do that. Uh, I'll put these into a Dropbox with a link. So anybody who wants the photographs can go and get them. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. It's always enlightening. I'm, I'm just really amazed. And thanks um, very much, Bonnie and Andrew for joining us. Um, is there any questions uh, from the people that remain that you guys would like to, to share? You're welcome to turn on your camera and ask any questions. We can hang out for a few more minutes. Joanne, thanks a lot for piping up with your knowledge and stuff as well. Um, well, I would, are, I would direct you to Bonnie for questions or um, the site, the native bee. What is the site, Bonnie? It's BC Native Bees. We can okay. uh, throw that in the chat again. Joanne, were you going to say something? You're welcome to. You. I, thanks. I just, how is it we're going to get uh, to see the pictures? There you go. Right. That was wonderful. I think you've just left us wanting more. Oh, good. good. <laughs> I want more too. <laughs> Let's do it again for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I it was fun. Thank you. Right. I always love chatting bees with people. So thanks everybody for showing up. And thank you, Laurie. And thank you, Chris and uh, Andrew. Oh, it's my pleasure. Hey, Pam. Hey, Pam. Hi, hi. I want to know why bees have hairy eyes and okay. some don't. Well, there you go. You may be the scientist to find out. No, I'm pretty sure I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that the honeybees and the um, the celioxis that have them aren't actually particularly closely related. So it's, it's you know, they're, they're, I mean, they're both long tongued bees, but that's it. The, the celioxis, the parasitic bee is much more closely related to the mason bee and the leaf cutter bee, and they don't have hairy eyes. And the honeybee is much more closely related to the bumblebees and they don't have hairy eyes. So what is it? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Are you going to download it to your computer then? Yes. Chris? Okay. All right. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night, night, all. Thank you. Good night. I don't think we'll ever.